this is gonna be painful because I have to admit to you some things that I learned the hard way. I've looked over my list a couple times and how I wish I could go back and tell myself, oh, watch out for this. <laughs> These are the top dirty secrets I wish I would have known when I first got started in photography. And if you were to come over here as a brand new or even as an intermediate photographer, these are some of the things that I would share with you. And I know a lot of you are gonna disagree with me. And if you have more that you wanna to add to the list, feel free to do so down below. So the first one I wanna start off with is that UV filters, for the most part, are completely useless. I know people who use them to protect their camera. But the whole idea of a UV filter is to filter out UV light. And the truth of the matter is they really don't add any benefit. And when they get dirty, they, they can actually degrade the image. I spent a lot of money when I first got started on UV filters for every single lens that I had is it just throwing money away. I know there are some cases where it can help with weatherproofing. You know, if you're worried about dropping your lens, if that's something that happens a lot, it, it can add a layer of protection. But I remember when I first got started, I bought UV filters for every lens that I had and I wanted to get the good ones. I was spending, you know, 60, $70 on UV filters, just a stupid waste of money. There's so much money that I've lost. <laughs> to think about. While we're talking about filters, and this is something I didn't learn until a couple years ago, is that most ND filters are not even ND filters. They are color cast filters that introduce a shift in color and they expect you to color correct it either in post or do a calibration beforehand. There are some good filters out there, but the vast majority of them are not good. Uh, something I never would have imagined is the vast majority of the work that I do, I use either one or two lenses. Usually it's one in between the focal length range of 24 to 70 or 24 to 105. On every camera system that I use, 80 to 90% of the time, it's the only lens that I use. When I got started, I went out and bought pretty much all the Canon EF, you know, the, the L lenses, the really nice ones. I spent tens of thousands of dollars on them and most of them had just sat being unused. Lens copies, talking about the same model of lens, the lens that I have, of a certain lens compared to the lens that you have of a certain lens are different. Even though they're made by the same company and they should be the same, they're not the same. The performance of lenses varies widely depending on the copy that you have. And even though companies come out and publish MTF charts, the truth of the matter is there's plenty of variation because lenses are not a perfect material. And because of this, when you spend big money on a lens, you should definitely be testing it making sure it's sharp in all the places it should be. And if it's not, you should return it. Something I didn't know when I first got started was that a good lens is far better than a good body. If you have a crappy lens, body's not gonna matter so much. Images are gonna be soft and it could be bad focusing. So if you're looking to invest, try lenses first. Gear acquirement syndrome, gas, is absolutely a real thing. You get excited about buying a new tool that will help you solve a problem, ideally. But there's this side of photography that we all experience that we wanna buy gear, mainly for the reason of buying new gear and it doesn't really get us shooting more. And the more of this gear that we purchase, the less of it we tend to use. And you should be focusing more on your skill sets than the tools that you are using. That's something that I think people figure out pretty quick is that the skills are far more important than the gear. Cameras follow a life cycle. And what I mean when I say this is that camera companies plan how new cameras are coming out and it usually falls under a predictable pattern, either a number of years or number of months. It can vary a little bit, but if you know the product cycle of your camera, you'll know when to sell it to maximize the value. So when the camera company comes out with a new camera, the moment they do that, your camera loses value in the eBay market in terms of reselling to other people. As soon as that new camera comes out, it's gonna drop. And if you follow the product life cycle, you will be able to save at least a couple hundred dollars by selling it right before the announcement. If you are watching you know, closely those kinds of things, you can definitely save yourself some money or selling it immediately when the announcement takes place. Sometimes it takes not as serious users a few days to figure out, hey, there's a new camera coming. And you know, once it's common knowledge, then you can expect the value of your camera to drop significantly. Something I wish you would have known. I'm gonna take that one a step further 
sometimes your camera company can die. We saw that with the Samsung line where people were going out and they were, Samsung was making, they were making a great camera in 2014. They had some pretty good lenses too. I was very impressed with Samsung, but for whatever reason, it just didn't get traction and a lot of people abandoned it. And so now they're not really even a thing. You may have bought all those lenses and yeah, they'll still work, but at some point you're gonna probably wanna move on to a new camera body and they're not making new ones. Painful lesson. Generic strobes are actually pretty good. Uh, in, in fact, when I got into the Canon strobe system, I was spending, I spent $1,000 just on the 600 EX RT2s. I got two of them and a commander. That was $1,000 right there. And when I was shooting weddings, I had two or th I had three different 580s. And it's changed a little bit now in that there are a number of knockoff flashes, Godox, for example, there's Cheetahs, tons of great strobes out there that really don't cost that much. If you know how to use the light, you can save yourself a lot of money by buying a generic strobe. Probably the number one thing that I wish I would have known when I first got started was that a good mentor can absolutely make a huge difference, but the number and the quality of the mentors out there varies widely. Okay, there are some really, really good mentors and there are some really terrible ones. There's a lot of imitators who have been shooting for you know, a couple months and they're trying to teach that they're out there. So when, when I first got started, we didn't have YouTube. I had to learn on my own. And it took me about two years to really get comfortable with them. I was so frustrated. And because when I got started, I didn't have a mentor. I had to go through a lot of trial and error and just learning and figuring things out on my own. Eventually I got it. And for beginners now, I would definitely say invest in some kind of a tutorial, some kind of training when you are learning your camera and first getting started. It's gonna save you a lot of time, a lot of hassle for beginning and intermediate photographers. When you start becoming a more advanced shooter, you're going to get the opportunity to attend a workshop. I have attended many workshops. I have put on many workshops. And what I learned was that sometimes photographers like to cram the number of attendees they have. So you're gonna have a very different experience attending a workshop that has four to six attendees versus a workshop that has 20 or 30. And I've been to the 20 and 30 workshops. I, I didn't feel like I got as much out of it. And in some cases, they kind of felt like they were holding back. They weren't giving, they weren't teaching everything that they that you wanted to know. And I'd ask questions, they wouldn't really answer it. Not thrilled about that. Some of these workshops are pretty expensive. You can expect to spend anywhere from 400 to two grand for a workshop, unless the photographer is super niche, meaning that they do something unique and original and only they are doing it. I would kind of shy away from the very expensive workshops where lots of people are attending and try to find uh, more intimate, I hate using that word, intimate workshops where there's just a few attendees and you can get more one-on-one -on -one time. Finally, when you are transitioning into expert level, when I say that, I mean you are becoming a pro shooter full time, it's going to be a huge advantage to find an intimate, I hate that word, an intimate mentor or a close contact mentor, maybe that's the better word, somebody that you can call or talk to every day, maybe not in person, maybe on the phone, maybe by email. And I have some students that I'm actually mentoring right now. I hope Marissa doesn't mind me talking about her. Marissa was essentially a stay-at-home mom. She has four kids, taking pictures of her kids, and she transitioned into couples and she got some opportunities. And the thing that she did great was she found a niche. She's a basically a Western horseback riding style photographer. Check her work out on Instagram. She's absolutely killing it right now. She's getting brand deals. She's making good money. She's, she's creating opportunities for herself and there were times she was in a jam and, and she called me up and said hey I got this problem XYZ and I would say okay this is what you need to do and when she was able to solve those problems like that 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 gives tremendous value to her clients so the mentor game on the high level is tricky because Many of them are not going to want to help you. It has to be kind of a win-win. I don't believe you should go to a high-end mentor and say, hey, teach me everything you know. You have to ask yourself the question is, how are they benefiting? Why would they want to help you? And sometimes that's going to come down to just paying them. And in those cases, it could be very well worth it where you're paying somebody on a monthly basis to get you through some of these tough, 
hurdles. When I first got started, I had some amazing mentors. Becker, famous in the wedding industry, he had materials and training videos that he would sell in terms of branding, very helpful, always answered my questions every time I reached out to him. And he does, I think he still does some training stuff. And then Arden was a photographer I met on a wedding shoot. And the trade-off with her was I became her second shooter. So I was able to give her my pictures, but she would sit down with me and give me feedback and tell me what I could do better, what was what I was doing right. Critically important to my development. I think it's one of the most important things if you are serious about going pro is finding a close contact mentor. As a bonus, I would probably also say something I didn't know was that most of the money, it seems, is in the wedding industry. That's the shortest distance between two points. If you're trying to make money, it is very competitive. So you, you have to be able to compete with lots of other people. However, if you can find a niche doing a specialty type of photography, you can still absolutely make money but I just wish I would have known. But suffice it to say, the shortest distance between mastering your camera and making good money, it's gonna be the wedding industry. It's very competitive. It's very tough to get into. It's very cutthroat, and you're going to have to find some competitive advantages if you want to operate in that space. But those are the top things I wish I would have known the dirty secrets of the photography industry. I'm sure you guys have many that I missed. I would love to hear them in the comments below. If you guys enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up. Hit that notification bell if you want to be notified when I have more videos like this coming out. I thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time.